Rebeca y era construir una máquina del tiempo.
Bene, buon pomeriggio. Well, good afternoon, everyone. In uh, this session devoted to the encyclical All Brothers, which actually attracted attention from all over the world. When in October 2020, less than one year ago, the encyclical was published, there was uh, immediately the idea that a new book had been opened on uh, the great desk of the world, a new perspective. So I think that we can only talk about what comes before the encyclical and most of all what comes after. And uh, so many people today are uh, working, are uh, thinking and are uh, communicating starting from this encyclical. So what is the uh, point, the theme, which is uh, so topical, so important, so profound, that was touched upon by Pope Francis with this encyclical? So this is what we are going to discuss today. And we have involved some important personalities. I would like, would like to welcome the Imam Damir Mukheddinov from Moscow. I hope you will be able to see him on the screen. Imam Damir is deputy chairman of uh, the Religious Board of Muslims in Russia. And he will talk about the reason why he is here with us today. It is the first time he is here with us at the meeting. We hope it's going to be the first of many more times in the future. And now I would like to give my warm welcome to someone who already spoke many times here in uh, Rimini. And I, well, I think I can say he is a friend of the meeting from Jerusalem, Rabbi David Rosen, International Director of Interreligious Affairs of the American Jewish Committee. as well as uh, director of the Heilbrunn Institute for International Interreligious Understanding. He is uh, known all over the world. Uh, he is uh, always uh, traveling uh, uh, around uh, the world because he's really one of the busiest person in the world because he's committed himself to the dialogue between uh, religions. So as I said, he was uh, uh, here. Uh, at the meeting in the past already in 1996. So I really think I can say that he is uh, a friend of the meeting and that we have uh, made a long uh, journey together. And then we have uh, Cardinal Matteo Maria Zuppi. He didn't have to come to go too far to reach us here. because he is the Archbishop of Bologna and he is one of uh, the um, most representative uh, figures of the Catholic Church. So well, he's here with us in spite of all his commitments and he uh, probably met so many people who wanted to talk to him today. So. Here, when he went from the restaurant to uh, this uh, hall, he met so many people who wanted to ask him something, who wanted to, to uh, meet him and talk to him about something. So, well, among the guests, we had also foreseen uh, the patriarch of uh, 
Babylon of the Chaldeans, Luis Rafael Sacco, but uh, for uh, a commitment he now has in Iraq, it wouldn't want to be possible for him to be connected to today's session. So, we have uh, tried to focus on the main theme of this encyclical, of this uh, document by the Pope, uh, and we will also be um, tackling uh, some um, specific aspects with uh, Cardinal Zuppi. But now, I'd like uh, to give the floor to Rabbi Rosen. The encyclical is, well, normally all encyclicals uh, have uh, s are destined to or are targeted at bishops and believers of the Catholic Church. But this encyclical has gone beyond these borders, and it is uh, actually targeted at everybody. This uh, document by Pope Francis is uh, trying to establish a dialogue with uh, the other great religions. So this is what I would like to hear uh, the opinion of Rabbi Rosen today. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Roberto. It is, uh, it is a great pleasure to be back again at the meeting. I send my blessings to you all from the Holy City of Jews. I would even go further in than your introductory comment. And I would say that uh, this encyclical is not just a call to other religions, it's a call to humanity. And it is precisely that human dimension of it that makes it so special. I would say that this encyclical could be said to epitomize Pope Francis's charisma as uh, a universal apostle, somebody whose appeal is not just to his own tradition, but goes beyond it and even beyond religion. Uh, and this, I think, is part of the enormous significance of Pope Francis on the stage of history. Uh, our religious traditions tend to a very significant degree be cowed, be uh, intimidated by uh, an aggressive secularism that questions whether religion has any relevance whatsoever for the modern world. And it's precisely by focusing on issues and in a manner uh, that he has done so. But more than that, because Francis has some kind of magic, as the word charisma suggests, that makes him accessible to people of different ages and of different persuasions from of such a broad spectrum, it means his words are heard in a way that very few religious leaders' words are heard, and even, I might say, even more than his predecessors, though probably it has a lot to do with the media technology of our time. Because as wonderful as this document is, I think it's important to say that the vast majority of it, if not all, is essentially reiterating and developing ideas already to be found amongst his predecessors. John Paul II used the term a human ecology to both expand our understanding of human relationships and our cosmos. And uh, Pope Benedict XVI wrote extensively on environmental issues and religious responsibilities. But I would venture to say <laughs> that they were not heard in the same way that Pope Francis has been heard. And this is a contribution not just for the Catholic Church. It is a contribution for all religious traditions. It, as I say, emphasizes the <coughs> relevance and um, significance of the religious voice in our times and for the critical issues that face us today, especially his critique of a culture of selfishness, greed, waste, extremism, and ethnocentricity of racism, and his essential religious call for human solidarity and fraternity. Uh, from sections 89 to 100 in the encyclical, there's emphasis on the principles of brotherhood and love and the worth of every person. It is a little surprising 
that I did not, I, unless I'm mistaken, find any reference to the principal, if you like, revolutionary biblical idea that opens Genesis, that the human person is created in the divine image. No references to the idea as that is found within Malachi, Malachi chapter 2, verse 10, that we all have one father, and therefore we are one family. And therefore, that is why we must not be bad to one another. All ideas, these universal ideas, so importantly emphasizes, which are to be found within the most fundamental and the most original of our uh, the texts that Jews and Christians in particular share. Uh, of course, one of the very important passages in Fratres uh, Omnes is this critique regarding a lack of concern and welcome for immigrants uh, and those who are seeking to enter new borders, so pertinent in our times. But we might also point out that there are those who are denied their own dignity within their own borders due to state compulsion and uniformity. Perhaps the most dramatic example of that in our times is the terrible persecution of the Uyghurs in China. Uh, and it would have been, I think, additionally helpful if we could have, and hopefully may have in the future, reference to the need to be able to maintain our principles uh, and not, therefore, to collaborate with iniquitous regimes. But I would like to also refer to two specific passages in the document where there are references to Jewish teaching and experience, which I think need to uh, be... Um, critiqued responsibly and hopefully positively. In uh, section 59, the document declares the following. In earlier Jewish tradition, the importance to love and care for others appears to be limited to relationships between members of the same nation. The ancient commandment to love your neighbor as yourself was usually understood as referring to one's fellow citizens. Usually, I point out. But then in 61, we have all the biblical references, which are uh, uh, indicating our obligations towards the stranger, love of stranger, care for the stranger, somebody who is not part of our own particular community. And of course, aside from the points that I've mentioned about the divine image and the quotation that I've referred to from uh, Malachi, from Malachi, there are also the other prophets uh, of Amos and Isaiah who all have this universal vision. And I think that's important to emphasize that Jesus' universalism is drawn precisely from the prophets and the heritage in which he was nurtured. Of course, there were insular interpretations of biblical texts generally stimulated by persecution. But the universal ones are, of course, deeply rooted within the fundamentals of what Christians call the Old Testament. The second comment that has a specific Jewish reference is that in section 247 that mentions the Shoah, the Holocaust, and says the Shoah must never be forgotten. And it's followed in 248 by the words, nor must we forget Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, if Pope Francis is trying to say that extern systematic exterminations and plans are tragic enough and we must not ignore other tragedies, then I think that's an important point if it would be phrased like that. But the way it appears, it suggests that there's some kind of equivalence between Hiroshima, Nagasaki and the Nazi systematic extermination of Jews simply because they were Jews. That, if it has any parallel in our times, could be compared perhaps to the Yazidis and their extermination. Or even in earlier times, the uh, extermination of Christian communities in the Ottoman Empire. But these are systematic exterminations. They are not situations of conflict. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we could argue extensively over whether this was a proportional or not. And I don't think anybody amongst us would say it was proportional. But we need to bear in mind that the Japanese initiated a war 
and we're not indicating any willingness to bring an end to that war and the barbarities that were performed, not only in China, but throughout Southeast Asia. Now, that means that there is a question here of how do you deal with conflict? Now, of course, Pope Francis says something very important, that war is always failure. Yes, it is failure of what needs to be the right approach, but pacifism is also a moral thing. And we have to be able to distinguish between the obligation to defend and the, un, uh, the disproportionate and, um, uh, and, and illegitimate overuse of violence. That, of course, is what the Bible teaches in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 17, where it says, you shall not stand by idly while your brother's blood is spilled. So it's important to make this distinction between violence that takes place within conflict and perhaps self-defense and sometimes exaggerated self-defense, as opposed to the systematic extermination of people simply because of their religion, their ethnicity, or their national origin. Allow me uh, to bring to a conclusion my, my, my comments with regards to the very beautiful uh, uh, passages within uh, within Fratelli Tutti in 7 and 282 that highlight the importance of dialogue and the importance of religious collaboration and even of sharing spiritual and moral values. Allow me to add that beyond this, interreligious dialogue is important as a part of deepening one's own faith. But even beyond our understanding of who we are as we engage the other, it introduces us to realms of spirituality and therefore to the divine presence beyond our own particular. And it's a very important tool for inculcating theological humility, to understand that we do not have all the answers, that the whole of truth is not to be found exclusively within our own one particular tradition. In 2.30 of the encyclical, there's a reference to overcoming divisions without losing identity. And in this regard, it's a pity that it doesn't mention interreligious dialogue, because interreligious dialogue is one of the most profound tools for giving people from different traditions a sense that they are respected and valued. In other words, it is a manifestation of the biblical value of hospitality, which Pope Francis has emphasized elsewhere. Of course, his idea of the ecological responsibility is particularly important, and of the danger of waste that I have referred to before. This actually is an ancient Jewish practice based upon first in Deuteronomy 2019 with regards to the prohibition of cutting down fruit trees, even in a situation of conflict of self-defense. Our sages in the Talmud drew uh, an a far for, for the ori argument that if in self-defense you must not destroy something of sustenance, how much more so on a normal basis? And as a result in Jewish tradition, a waste has always been seen as an impiety against God himself. And there, this uh, has enormous ramifications, of course, today in terms of our environment as a whole. The uh, encyclical includes a criticism of the conditions of food production and also uh, the situation of uh, the mismanagement of resources. We need to point out that the major polluter of our world today is the livestock industry, more than all the forms of transport put together. As the United Nations study, livestock's dark shadow has proved. And therefore, there is a need to be able to follow a model that is central to the biblical message and that actually at one time even Christianity would follow, and that is a certain dietary disciplines. And the dietary discipline of our time makes it clear that Consuming and adding to the consumption of animal products is not only causes the enormous waste of water, land, and other resources more than anything else, it also poses a major ecological environmental threat. And therefore, we need to adopt more, not only more modest lifestyle, but we need to adopt to the degree that we are able a plant-based diet, because that way of life is the demonstration of love of our world. It contributes to our love of neighbor, and it expresses our respect for the God of creation that is highlighted in this wonderful insight. Thank you. Grazie. Grazie.
Grazie, dott- thank you, thank you, Mr. Rosen. And now from Jerusalem, we move to Moscow. And there has been an unexpected and surprising uh, fact because the Russian translation of the encyclical was promoted by the Muslim Forum, the Russian Muslim Forum. And this really raised a lot of interest in us because we now are interested in knowing why uh, this work has been considered interesting in uh, culture, in a religion, in a reality that is so important and significant of Muslim people in Russia. And it's been so interesting that they decided to disseminate it. This was really um, interesting to us. We were impressed. And uh, uh, Imam Damir probably will talk about this. So thank you. You have the floor. Dear brother uh, Roberto, I'm uh, glad to uh, see you all in Rimini, and I would like to extend my greetings from the capital of the Russian Federation. May peace be with you and the mercy of the highest. First of all, I would like to uh, thank the Creator, God, because uh, He inspired he is a servant, Pope Francis, to write uh, the encyclical Fratres Omnes. The Pope in the encyclical says that his uh, encounter with the Sheikh uh, Al Aksmar and with the Muslim uh, world have inspired him to write the encyclical itself. So I started translating this text and uh, I took care of its publication of this wonderful work because over the last few months, uh, last year, I was with my mother who was ill and I stayed uh, with her six months. I was staying at home with her, looking after her. I never left my house to take care of my mother 24 hours a day. And uh, in the meantime, I uh, heard that many people in the world were dying or were getting sick because of the COVID-19. And um, I uh, would read all the calls made by Pope Francis and uh, I was really, really touched uh, in the deepest part of my uh, soul. I read his words about uh, the humanity that uh, was without uh, treatment, without a cure for uh, its uh, most uh, fragile people. These people uh, were not really considered in society. And when you have your mother in front of you who is dying, uh, she was an elderly person, she was 80 years old, and so you uh, connect this to the whole humanity. You see that uh, children abandon their um, parents uh, without any reason, and there is now the pandemic as a sort of new divinity that is devouring victims and is uh, tolling every day more and more victims. So the time is high to go back to friendship and social fraternity. And uh, Pope Francis uh, addressed this topic, and in doing so, in my view, he continued the historical process that was present in the Catholic Church. I would like to mention that in 1965, there was a historical document, Nostra Etate. More than 50 years ago, the Catholic uh, Church, after a long journey of 2,000 years, a journey that uh, did not uh, 
give any room to people from other religious religions or for example Mohammed was considered a false prophet and all other religions were not really considered and so 2000 years it, it took 2000 years for the catholic uh, thought for the catholic thinking to change to produce new words that i would like to quote although during the centuries uh, between christians and muslims there were disagreements and hostilities i would like uh, to make a call and uh, uh, invite everyone to forget the past to start understanding each other really and to start supporting each other mutually for the truth peace justice and freedom pope francis continues to develop uh, this thought and in his encyclical he gives uh, uh, a lot of room to muslim people to representatives of uh, other religions and he called upon us, all of us, uh, representatives of these uh, religions, uh, not to be just uh, uh, civil servants of these religions, but to talk with our heart, to look at the suffering. I was really inspired and I was really touched by uh, Francesco's speech when in Italy he emphasized the importance to welcome migrant people and displaced people, those who are arriving from Middle East countries without any possession, without any roof, any right, because they should be uh, helped and churches should open their doors to let uh, these uh, migrant people and these displayed people in so that God through the church could really show its loving face towards these people. It would really be important to help those in need. Many times we forget these uh, very important and simple words when we face uh, today's reality. In my view, Pope Francis is an extraordinary, beautiful example of theologian who, a man of church with his simplicity and with his moral example can enlighten people's heart, can uh, feed our thinking, and he shows an extraordinary example that should be imitated Unfortunately, my mom passed away on the 25th of December when Christians, Catholics and Protestants celebrate Christmas. And the translation of the encyclical uh, was finished a few days ago. I'm showing the book in Russian. So that was that. I mean, those dates coincided. The, the publication was ready upon, around that time, and um, I could really go into Francesco's words and uh, his example of mercy and help towards uh, people that do not have anything and that need help and care. To me, this is a very important topic. For example, savor is really important. When we talk about dialogue, if we think that salvation is only possible within one's own religion, then dialogue is really hard to start because uh, any possible uh, confrontation, any possible dialogue uh, is with somebody who is uh, uh, destined to go to hell. So what should be done? We should then try and convert him or her to one's own only way of salvation, that is one's own religion. But I see 
that this is a problem because there is no possibility to have a dialogue in this way. There is no possibility to open one's heart and to convert to God because God takes people to his uh, journey, to his path. It is a sort of a politicization of our religion, of our faith. In Pope Francis' uh, encyclical, I found a lot of soul, a lot of good. I saw what a person should say when he or she talks in the name of God and when he or she calls upon God and tries to fulfill God's uh, uh, work. I know that many Muslim people, many imams and many scholars in Russia that read this book came to me and thanked me cordially for these words. They said that it is really a great work. It was helpful. It inspired us to make new step forward in our faith. I'm not going to go through the whole text of the encyclical now. I think that uh, every scholar, every person who is uh, interested uh, should uh, know this uh, uh, work. What I've done is trying to disseminate this uh, uh, good word, this important word, so that it can strengthen men and women in the 21st century. So that uh, in our country we can avoid having fundamentalism and violence as dominant factors. Once more, I would like to extend my blessing and my best wishes for uh, friendship and fraternity that is so current today in this moment. It is really important to consider the situation in Afghanistan where there are so many people suffering who have been abandoned to the violence of uh, uh, these uh, terrorists. And we saw terrible views of people falling down from airplanes. Um, we keep praying for all these people in Afghanistan, and we hope that the example of Pope Francis can help Muslim countries to open their mosques and to support people regardless of their religion and regardless of their nationality. We hope they can help them and give them some support to go back to dignity and love. May God, the creator of the world, preserve us in good health. Thank you. Bene, grazie. Thank you. Thank you to Imam Damir. Also for mentioning Afghanistan, I would have mentioned it myself in a few minutes. And now, well, we have a surprise because uh, we have with us, I can see now on the screen, Cardinal Luis Sacco. Patriarca di Babilonia dei Caldei, lo ringrazio moltissimo per who's uh, the patriarch of uh, Babylon, of uh, the uh, Chaldeans. And I'm really glad that he can be here with us. He's uh, the shepherd of uh, 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 of uh, sheep that are completely um, suffering at the moment. But at the same time, he received a concrete demonstration of the um, message of all brothers with the apostolic journey of Pope Francis to Iraq 
last March. So uh, welcome, welcome to the Patriarch of Babylon of the Chaldeans. And uh, well, you have the floor and thank you for being being here. Well, uh, we're really glad to readjust our uh, schedule uh, for uh, today. So you have the floor. Well, uh, this visit was really a historic moment for us. The Pope brought hope to all the Iraqi people. His words touched everyone, Muslims and Christians. People are still talking about the visit of the Pope. And for us Christians, this visit gave us the courage to say that we are Christians. We are no, we are no longer scared to say we are uh, Christians. We are proud to be Christians. We are appreciated in a world that is dominated by conflicts, by wars, uh, that destroys every relationship among people. People who are different, but in the end, we are all brothers. Like the Pope said so many times. So, well, uh, also uh, your society based on individualism, consumerism, well, we have to try and uh, move on to do more, to be uh, brave enough and say, we are Christians, we are Muslims, but we have to respect everybody. There is a moral issue in the world. So these moral values are left behind and they are uh, crushed by corruption, by the problems people have, by conflicts and uh, wars and attacks. So we have to go back to the source of our faith, of our humanity. We are all humans, we are all brothers, also those who do not believe. We do respect them, but they must respect us, believers. So, well, these aspects need to be highlighted, to be defended, to actually save humanity. So, uh, the well, Muslims were really touched by the words of the Pope because uh, we Christians are more used to the uh, words of the Pope when he talks about uh, forgiveness, which is different uh, from revenge. When he talks about uh, peace, uh, reconciliation with other uh, religions. So these are uh, themes that society seems uh, to have lost. Well, thank you. Thank you for reminding us of the impact of the Pope's journey to Iraq and something we all still remember very well. So, well, uh, I am in the Cardinal of Bologna. One of the aspects of the encyclical that really was uh, in a way astonishing is that uh, it goes beyond uh, the uh, believers uh, of uh, the Catholic Church. So well beyond the boundaries uh, that uh, previous encyclicals had. What made this uh, change come about? Why? 
do we have uh, this universal interest from everywhere in the world towards this encyclical? What are the words of the Pope that really attracted all this attention? Well, uh, thank you, first of all. And I think that uh, the uh, the things we have heard, and uh, I hope that we will uh, be able to have another round afterwards, uh, show how uh, All Brothers is a decisive message. As the Patriarch said, Iraq was one of the countries that suffered the most it, uh, in the latest years. So the Pope's uh, visit to Iraq is uh, actually a demonstration of what uh, all brothers mean. And uh, I think that uh, when uh, the Pope visited the Shiite leader, there were uh, um, placards saying, you are a part of us and we are a part of you. So this is the message of all brothers. This is what all the encyclical wants us to understand, to recognize, because otherwise we don't even recognize ourselves. So we have, I have the countdown uh, in a way in front of me. Well, it is an analogy of life, actually. We always think to have, uh, uh, with time, with all this time, ahead of us, but it's not so. Well, anyway, so we should not miss this opportunity. The pandemic actually is a great opportunity for us to understand, old brothers. Uh, the Pope started writing this encyclical before the pandemic, and then he went on writing and took the opportunity offered by the pandemic because it really shows how this message is decisive. Otherwise, we waste time like this countdown is showing me. But we have to bear in mind that we can waste opportunities, we can waste time. So as I said, the pandemic is a very, very important opportunity. It makes us understand other pandemics, those of the war, those of illness, those that were mentioned before. There are no experts. We thought many times that uh, there are uh, those who are experts in dialogues and those who just, um, well, are just spectators, where uh, the encyclical is involved, involves everyone. One could say, well, I uh, don't speak foreign languages. Well, this is a language that we all need to learn because there is no future if we don't learn this language and if we do not recognize the others as our brothers. Man is uh, himself in this dialogue. We should not waste time. We should not waste this opportunity. Pope Francis has said in the past that we should not lose the awareness of the situation. So we're all on the same boat, but that might even be a question, are we on the same boat? Because we think about different things. We should read uh, uh, All Brothers together with another encyclical, Laudato Si, uh, because it is the, the, this is the only house of the world has uh, um, John Paul, uh, as uh, Paul the Sixth said, but all brothers shows us that we are actually all brothers. So we need to learn to talk to each other, which is not something we can take for granted. It is not so easy to speak to people that we perceive as enemies because we don't know them. So. Um, uh, for many years, and I believe Rabbi Rosen remembers this, after Assisi, a new spirit was born, which was uh, very, uh, so to speak, uh, cautious at the beginning, uh, because uh, we were really um, uncertain in what we were doing. The problem was uh, to convince so many people people belonging to different religions, different cultures. And we, in a way, uh, were uh, scared to lose ourselves. So, well, uh, during the meetings with the community of Sant'Egidio, the rabbi has uh, participated many times, 
we said we have to go on with this spirit. We cannot live spiritually divided in a world which is more and more united every day. If the pandemic is, in a way, the contrary, we need to um, base ourselves to this spirit, to this message of all brothers. This is the only way to salvation, as the patriarch said. The pandemic touches every single one of us because uh, the, it is a small world. Pope Francis, or rather, let's learn from the pandemics. Let's uh, learn how to abandon the cocoon of the eye and to become really um, become people can manage their own eye because we discover the others. So we should really avoid to build other walls. We should. Uh, Remember that there can't be any future otherwise. So we are all on the same boat because we cannot save ourselves as individuals. Let's think about vaccination. Let's think about solidarity that can uh, enable us or that can help us save ourselves. So we have to think about this together and be spiritually united. The dream of uh, the encyclical is a world like a family because man is not an island. And uh, uh, Pope Francis is uh, talking to everybody because uh, that's what the encyclical says. All brothers, uh, as the Imam uh, Damir said, otherwise uh, fanatism could emerge because we do not recognize the other. So we have to overcome what divides us without losing our own identity. And this calls for a fundamental sense of belonging. The uh, 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 basic idea of uh, uh, all brothers is that there is no I without the others. A, a human being cannot develop if um, they, it, it, he can give himself or herself. I can communicate with myself if I can communicate with the other. So this is the message of all brothers. Uh, well, this is extremely important because we cannot save ourselves on our own because we are all, all on the same boat. Fanatism, which is uh, unfortunately very common, is not the real religion, as many might think, and uh, doesn't help to to have a real relationship to other to uh, the others. Life is based on fraternity, and this is on brotherhood, and this is the great dream in this. Um, a reality that is based on uh, realism, limited realism in a way, because it is based on the interest of uh, uh, single people, of individual interests. Well, I believe that this is an extraordinary dream because uh, it brings new hope. And this is the, the actual realism. Many people says, uh, say this is uh, naive. You, you don't realize that this is not uh, the, well, the case. Well, it is actually the opposite. It is realistic uh, to say that only by meeting and knowing that the others are thinking together, uh, struggling together, uh, we can actually save ourselves so that we can defend our uh, common house, common home. So there are no alternatives to this. There are no alternatives at all. Where inequality is strong, there is always violence. And when religions are used in a blasphemous way to justify religion, well, this is why it is so important, this encyclical, and why it is so important to have meetings like we are having today. 
because they show that religions are a source of peace. And this is how I would like to conclude my intervention. If we do not save ourselves together, then anyone, everyone will be by uh, themselves. And only the uh, strongest can actually find a way to save themselves. So this is not this does not mean being naive. On the contrary, it is naive believing that we can uh, actually manage without uh, our uh, fellow human beings. So we really need to use this great opportunity, this great dream of uh, interreligious dialogue because we need to think together to build together a new path because otherwise uh, we will have hell on earth. Religions could be even be used to condemn people rather than understand people. Some say dialogue means a weakness, but it is uh, exactly the opposite. Those who are weak are not open to dialogue. Those who do not know who they are are open to dialogue. It's within a dialogue that you find your own identity together with the other. So this is our challenge. This is uh, the most important aspect. You can't have I if you don't if you don't have you and we. So the di dialogue is the only way. So we really should be worried when we are used to live without the others and in the many, in the many pandemics of violence and wars. A very last thing, there are so many battles we have to fight together in the encyclical. For instance, there is the death penalty because it's not just like the death penalty, but what it means, the culture that stays behind the death penalty and the defeat of the idea of uh, death penalty means respecting life. And here again, I'm thinking about uh, humanitarian corridors and the cooperation between uh, religious leaders in favor of uh, people uh, living in difficult situation in favor of victims of conflict. This is proof that uh, dialogue and uh, works in a way. And I would like to quote Pope Francis when he uh, launched an appeal uh, for the victims of any religion, because in Iraq, Many uh, religious places were hit, attacked, so the Pope prayed for all the victims. And as uh, you know, uh, it is uh, said that uh, when someone uh, saves a man, he saves the whole world. The same is uh, said in uh, the uh, Quran. And uh, Pope Francis, uh, Pope Francis says, if God is God of life, we cannot kill our brothers in his name. If God is a God of peace and he is, we cannot uh, wage war in his name. If God is a God of love, uh, we cannot hate our brothers. Let's pray together for all the victims of the war so that uh, God Almighty can uh, uh, grant them eternal life and uh, limitless uh, uh, peace because uh, apart from our religious uh, um, ideas, we can live in harmony and peace because we are all brothers and sisters. So this is uh, the message of, of all brothers. Grazie. Thank you. Thank you. Now, very briefly, I would like to go through a very short round of comments from our guests. Uh, 
now uh, it is true that Cardinal Sacco from Baghdad has left us already, so his participation was quite uh, fast, but it was significant. He managed to find this little uh, time, and that's a sign of the affection that he feels uh, for the meeting in Rimini. Now, I would like to uh, invite our three guests to make uh, another short comment, uh, and I'm going to mention some points. Robin Rosen uh, mentioned uh, the divine image in the Bible, and I would like to emphasize this uh, in view of the fraternity that is uh, possible thanks to the fact that we, are bra that we are sons, that we are children. The fact that we are children makes it possible to be brothers and sisters. That's the basis. Then from Imam Jamir, I found uh, quite relevant the fact that in uh, the Fratres Omnis, uh, the result of an encounter can be found, as he mentioned, uh, an encounter between Pope Francis and uh, the uh, great Imam of Al-Azhar, Al-Tayeb, who um, basically, basically, it was a friendship that uh, uh, created these direct dialogues and uh, led to the document of Abu Dhabi on the universal um, brotherhood and then the global education pact of Pope Francis. There is still uh, this uh, idea, this memory of uh, the encounter. So it is interesting to see how an encyclical is the result not just of a theoretical or theological reflection, but uh, it's also been spurred by a direct relationship with the other, an I and a you that gets together. This is uh, really interesting. And then uh, the cardinal now mentioned uh, a kind of new grammar that is needed, and I'm um, uh, impressed to see that uh, in a global context uh, there is a, there are attempts to uh, understand each other with the multilateral ni dialogue uh, and international institutions the united nations and many agencies all this shows that uh, there is now a moment of difficulty of crisis of all these big organizations of all this process that started uh, after second world war the pope seems to offer a new perspective a new uh, way to start uh, living together again, also from a political and diplomatic uh, perspective. If we acknowledge that uh, we are children, it could be an opportunity to uh, start a negotiation, to start living together, to start again to uh, set the common walls of a common uh, house. This is reference also to the idea of the Catholic Church as a unique uh, human family. This is present in the doctrine of the Church. So these are uh, all the ideas that I noted down. And uh, I would like to refer once more to Cardinal Zuppi's words about uh, humanitarian corridors. That's an ob a concrete objective. We now uh, all know the I terrible images from Afghanistan with the uh, uh, mothers throwing their children to find salvation and the terror and the threats menacing thousands of people. So there must be now an alliance. We have to have a common objective. We have to push our authorities to create a big humanitarian corridor for this situation. Sorry, I give the floor now to uh, David Rosen but this idea of being brothers and being children, I think it was very interesting. Please, Dr. Rosen. Thank you, Roberto. Well, let me then follow on from your comments. Point out that uh, while this idea that we are all children of God, that we are all created in the divine image, regardless of gender, race, or origin, is the sacred principle that we have to nurture. It's easier said than done, as indeed all the good things that we have said today are easier said than done, as even creating a humanitarian corridor is easier said than done. 
because the problem is something within human nature. And that human nature has to be addressed. And what is that problem? The problem to a large degree has to do with our insecurity. And conflict is almost always a manifestation of some kind of alienation. Even domestic conflict in a marriage is a reflection of an alienation. And that alienation comes from a feeling that one in some way is threatened or not respected. When people feel truly respected, then their ability to open up their hearts and to be welcoming and to embrace is facilitated. This is what I meant when I spoke about interreligious dialogue as the expression of hospitality. Now, there's, it's not just interreligious dialogue. Interreligious dialogue is a special gift, a special calling that those of us who are people of faith are able to do because we are people of faith. But the need for human security, because this is the brilliance of, uh, front of Pope Francis's uh, focus. He's focusing upon the common humanity. And if we want the common humanity to come forth, then we have to recognize that what prevents it is fundamentally insecurity. When people are secure, they can operate with a largesse that is not there when they feel threatened. And if we take especially situations with regards to the Muslim world, and this probably pertains to the Taliban, there is a perception that the Western world does not respect Islam and therefore does not respect them. Now, I'm not saying that means they can get away with whatever they want to do. But the engagement, the form of engagement, cannot be one in which I seek to impose myself on the other. That simply will only produce short-term results and not long-term lasting effects. We have to develop a culture of respect. And that respect means requires knowledge. There's a very interesting text, of course, in the Quran, in, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 47, verse 13, that says, oh, in the words of God, O oh, humankind, we have created you from a single couple and made you into peoples and nations that you may know one another. It in some ways echoes the passage that we see in Malachi, where, in, if I'm not mistaken, chapter 3, where you have the verse, then that those that fear the Lord um, spoke with one another, and the Lord heard it and registered it, wrote it down in a book of those who revere him and respect his name. Now, we may ask a question, what's the big deal about knowing one another? What's so important about talking to one another about dialogue? The importance is, as Cardinal Matteo said, if we don't know one another, then we can so easily demonize one another. We suspect one another. We see the other as a threat. This intensifies our insecurity. These verses from the Quran and from the Hebrew Bible emphasize that for humans to be able to pursue peace and to create the kind of society God wants us to create, we have to know one another. We need to teach our children about one another. Every form of religious education should include education about other traditions and heritage, especially within the family of Abraham. Ignorance produces suspicion, produces insecurity, produces a sense of threat, leads to conflict. Therefore, critical to all these beautiful ideas is basically what we might call inter-religious literacy. And inter-religious literacy should be an essential component of any educational system that seeks to be able to lead people towards constructive, peaceful, and healing living. Grazie. Thank you. Our countdown now is uh, red. Uh, that means that uh, in a moment we will be turned off. We will self-destroy ourselves. So now I invite Imam Damir to take the floor on these uh, points that we have mentioned. I would like to thank uh, Rabbi Rosen for his remarks.
I would like to uh, mention uh, my visit to the Vatican in the meeting with the Cardinal Tran, who's told me, Damir, you uh, deal with dialogue. However, to deal with the dialogue, uh, one, first of all, has to be a person of dialogue. These words really impressed me, and I thought about them for a long time, and rightly so, Cardinal Zuppi and the other guests uh, said that it is really important to know oneself and to know one's own identity and not to fear to know the identity of the other people. I believe that uh, the pandemic has been an enormous challenge for all of us because uh, it really puts uh, the truth of our religion to the test. Every day there are millions of people in need of our help, of our good word and of our compassion. I would like to uh, thank from the bottom of my heart uh, the organizers of the meeting for giving us this wonderful opportunity to meet and uh, to extend, to bring these words of love and respect to all the world. I really hope that the message uh, of Pope Francis uh, shall continue to enlighten the heart of people and to strengthen love, faith, hope for a, a better future of, of peace and uh, happiness. Thank you. Al-Imam Damir, anche perché ci ha ricordato un grandissimo... Thank you very much, Imam Damir. You mentioned uh, a friend of the meeting, Cardinal Toran, who participated in the meeting many times, and we always remember him. Now, a brief uh, conclusion to his eminence. Just a half an hour more, not just kidding. Well, brotherhood is possible if uh, we consider ourselves children. That's true. Well, we said that there are problems, and there will always be problems, as uh, Rabbi Rosen said. When can we overcome problems? We can do that when there is a dream, when there is hope, when we want to reach something so one does not dwell on problems. It is inevitable to have problems. Irrealism stops there, but hope and love goes over them because uh, they want to reach something. In this sense, uh, Fratres Omnes is a big dream. It is the result of a journey, as you rightly said, and I think that this is really important. It's not uh, the result of a uh, workshop. It is the result of history. We understand that in history we understand our calls, our vocations. The Pope in Iraq uh, mentioned the image of the carpet. He said diversities are like many different colored threads, and in Iraq they know about this, that when they put together, they make a, a single beautiful carpet that is testimony of our fraternity, but also of its source, because God is the artist that designed this uh, carpet and that was uh, kneeled with uh, patience and uh, adjusted with patience. And we should uh, stay um, together as brothers and sisters in the same way. There's always someone who would like to break the carpet and say, state that the thread is uh, stronger if it stays on its own and if it, lose all, if it loses all the other colors. But that's not the case because it would lose its sense to be part of this carpet. That's why we should fight against all those measures that prevent us from acknowledging the other. We refer to measures uh, undertaken after World War II. All the people, all responsible people, were aware that uh, a third world war would have been the last of all wars. And uh, we should be aware of the fact that we are already experiencing another war, so we should get out of this pandemic with the belief 
that we should have places to talk and to speak. And now I will finish. While some tries to have enemies instead of being friends, while many tries to take advantage of the others, those who look at the stars of promises, those who, look, who follows the ways of God, will be together with the others and not against the others. That's what we have experienced this evening, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much. I would like to thank once again all uh, our guests connected from Jerusalem and from Moscow. We hope uh, to have soon an opportunity to get together in presence again, because it is uh, like uh, going back home once again. In the meeting bookshop, uh, there is a text uh, by Cardinal Sacco that is entitled Stronger Than Terror, published in 2015 about his experience and the experience of Christians in Iraq. And there are many books by Cardinal Zuppi in the meeting bookshop, including this one, You Shall Hate Your Brother, which is a uh, an unusual title. We sort of forget about fraternity, and today it was an opportunity to remember that. And uh, to conclude, I would like to thank once more all the people on behalf of the meeting. I would like to thank all the guests, and I would also remind you that uh, the meeting needs your support. Your support this year will help the welcoming house in Kampala in Uganda which is a well-known project uh, here, but that did not receive a, a specific support. So in the uh, donation desks, you can uh, uh, give your contribution to continue to help this experience. Thanks again. Bye-bye, Moscow. Bye-bye, Jerusalem. And uh, goodbye from Rimini, too. Thank you all, and uh, I wish you all a very good uh, afternoon and evening.
volverá ahí. Altísimo. El astronauta. Comprese que el único modo para encontrar eso de Cari era construir una máquina del tiempo.
Thank you.